seven years. It has taken seven years for my rhythm game RPG, Disharmony, to go from concept to release. For those of you who just want to see how much money I made, how many copies I sold, all that stuff, skip ahead to the timestamp on screen, um, for the rest of you. Let's see how my long journey finally came to an end. For anyone who hasn't followed the project, Disharmony is, like I said, a rhythm game RPG. Think Earthbound meets Guitar Hero, or something to that effect. The game also features some elements of psychological horror and other random stuff I like. One of the cooler aspects is how the game's dungeons are the dreams of the game's main characters, meaning each one has a unique style and setting based on the game's cast. With that out of the way, let's quickly recap some stuff I mentioned in my last devlog from over a year ago. I set out to work every day until the game was done with the exception of 20 free days where I could do whatever I wanted, no work necessary. That didn't go well. I burned out severely, and it actually caused me physical harm further down the line, but we'll get to that when we get to it. I shaved my beard and decided not to so much as trim it again until the game was done. And that I did. I looked absolutely awful for several months, but at least it was satisfying to finally get rid of the damn thing. As for the state of the game itself, I was working on some of the endgame cutscenes, I'd hooked all the dungeons up to the game so that they could be accessed without debug tools or save editing, and I'd added a handful of achievements. All the systems were in place, but there were lots of enemies missing, a lot of puzzles were unfinished, and there was a lot of music left to write. I still had a lot of work ahead of me. Let's go through some of the events in chronological order, shall we? Towards the end of the summer, I started a six-month-long internship as a game designer, which was part of my education at Future Games. While this did eat up a lot of my time, the schedule was very relaxed and my team was very efficient, so I often ended up finishing my days very early, and thus I still had a good few hours where I could work on my game. That, and play Xenoblade 3. I got really addicted to Xenoblade 3. Oh my god, it is! It is Xenoblade! Oh my god! Holy shit! Oh my god! Oh my god! So, what was the first piece of content I made during the time that I documented? Drumroll, please! This updated sandwich sprite. Real important stuff. <clears throat> More importantly, though, it was around this time that I finished the layouts and designs for Amber and Ellie's Nightmares. There were still details missing, but they were effectively done. I finally got around to adding this little side town called Ashbourne, the ruined capital of the country, which is now a battlefield between aliens and ghosts. They're pretty chill though, nothing to worry about. The music here changes depending on which side of the town you're in. The instrumentation will sound spooky and hollow in the ghost space, and synthetic and techno-y inside the alien's mothership. The commanders of the two armies are some of the few characters in the game who have multiple lines of dialogue if you talk to them more than once consecutively. If you go all the way north in Ashbourne, you end up at Caligar Castle, where a song I teased years ago plays. I eventually got around to finishing all the enemy sprites. That was a whole ordeal. I like to keep track of our milestones for programs I use when possible. Throughout the past year, the amount of time I'd spent in A sprites gradually went from around 200 hours to 250 to 300, and it's now somewhere at around 350. I drew a lot of sprites and animations for this game. It's too bad there are an art style limit when I'm 17 and have no idea what I was doing, but WHAT CAN YOU DO?! The size of the game increased a lot too. It was sitting at somewhere less than 600 megs around this time, but it ended up becoming over a gig and a half. And unless you count Ace Bright, Disharmony became my most played Steam game, climbing its way up into my top 5, then 3, then eventually took over the number 1 spot. The game's like 7 hours long, by the way. If you've seen any trailer for the game, you're probably aware of this scene where you're doing the character Ash. I originally planned on using the trailer music for this fight, but it quickly became apparent that it just wouldn't fit the mood I was going for. I instead dug through some of Chris's, my brother-in-law has made most of the game's music, old songs, and found one that had a neat melody at the end. I rewrote and developed that melody into a full song, which was much more fitting for what I was trying to do. I also took some inspiration from songs like Mani's theme from Pokemon and Alpha Toby style from Homestuck, and added the sound of the crowd shouting hey in the background of the song. The song is pretty simple, but I've heard a couple people say they really like it.
thing about the duel is that it's the first part of the game that's actually quite demanding. You can only make so many mistakes or else you'll have to try again from the beginning. It's meant to be challenging, but I was worried it might be a little too hard. The solution I settled for was to gradually increase the amount of mistakes the player is allowed to make, which seems to be a fairly effective solution. But I had something with a bit more character in mind at one point. I thought it would be funny if, after failing like five times in a row, Ash would take pity on you and help you out despite the player failing to win the duel, in a tone that says, wow bud, you really suck. Because I love that kind of stuff in games, like that easter egg in The Curse of Monkey Island, where you bug Guybrush about entering the lake until he finally gives in. However, Ash's entire character arc kind of relies on the player impressing her and teaching her to turn her ego down a notch, and I just wasn't in a position to rewrite the entire script based on how well the player performs, so that idea got scrapped real quick. It was fun though. When September rolled around, Chris sent me a message about some songs he found on his hard drive that might work for the game, as well as the code for Guitar Pro 8. The next day, he sent a good 40 or so songs to my email, and some of them were pretty much exactly what I needed at the time. Genuinely perfect timing. I had a controller prompt of the game. The game doesn't automatically detect controllers being connected, because some people might want to use their keyboard even if there are Xbox controllers plugged in, or if they accidentally touch it while using the other. So switching between prompts has to be manually done from the settings menu. But it works out pretty well. It took a while to draw the icons though. Speaking of settings, I added a whole heap of new ones, including stuff like VSync. It was also around this time that I finalized how the equipment items work. They just add a number to your attack and max HP stats. Nothing fancy, but they have a major effect on how battles feel. But as always, as things start to look like they're going pretty well, something horrible always has to happen because that's just life apparently. In November of 2022, I got COVID-19 for the second time. I hadn't been out partying, I hadn't been out in town a bunch, uh, and as far as I'm aware it wasn't a new wave or branch or anything, I just got really unlucky. I still worked a bunch in the game though, which as it turns out, may have been a bad decision. Let's do some rapid fly points, yeah? I added a bunch of sound effects to the game, mainly in cutscenes. I wasn't sure if this one for Ellie's introduction was a good choice at first, but honestly, I kinda love it. A new Game Maker update broke Steam functionality, yippee! While attempting to write a new Final Boss track, I accidentally just wrote a bootleg version of the Final Boss theme from Kirby Planet Robobot, and was upset at myself like two days straight. I added a sprite scene for five frames that took half an hour to add. I doubled, if not tripled, the amount of achievements. Chris sent me even more music, and it was great! I added more birds to the opening area to subtly guide the player in case they couldn't figure out where to go. I added books to the library in Insania, the Halloween-themed town. The ones on the left are lore-related, and the ones on the right are jokes. And eventually, I completed the map. The next topic is about one of the most important things to ever happen to the game from a marketing standpoint. I was pretty sad around this time. I'd spent so much time and effort working on the game, and I knew there was a very high possibility that no one would ever play it. After more than a year of it being on Steam, with multiple devlogs released, a couple shoutouts throughout the internet, and many attempts at marketing through social media, the game had only acquired about 250 wishlists on Steam which, in the grand scheme of things, is nothing. Your game's amount of wishlists is the most important statistic for your game to be promoted on the platform, and the amount it had at the time was less than a drop in an ocean. I sat down in a last-ditch effort to get the game some recognition before launch by just talking to my camera, telling people about my situation, and somehow, it blew up. I don't mean to say it went viral and got hundreds of thousands of views or anything, but this is what my view count usually looks like. This is how well the video did. So, for my standards at least, it most certainly blew up. In a single day, the game received several hundred wishlist editions, and both my personal YouTube channel as well as this channel passed 100 subscribers. I tried to get over 100 subscribers when I was a teenager and made Let's Play videos on Zelda games, and I only ever barely passed 40. I wouldn't be surprised if a large percentage of people watching this video right now are people who found this channel through that video, and if so, thank you. Thank you for sticking with me. <laughs> Genuinely. The days following that video were great, and I doubt I'll ever forget the walk I took that night listening to music as I internally freaked out about the fact that the game was finally getting attention after over half a decade of being on the internet. <laughs> Along with that video, I decided to delay the game one last time to give proper time for playtesting. I didn't say it in the video itself, but the game was set for release in February 2023, which led to the game getting delayed indefinitely only a few weeks later, but again, we'll get to that in just a moment. See that smile I had on my face? Let me keep it a little longer. In the meantime, I had a soundtrack to finish. I had to figure out how to simulate the sound of a shinobu because all the VSTs I could find online sucked. 
I ended up combining the sound of a shakuhachi and a piccolo to get a decent enough result. There's a part of the game where you can encounter an easter egg of sorts where Amber sings a song, and thanks to my friend Casper, I was able to find a suitable female vocalist. Big thanks to Rachel for helping out, especially on such short notice. I also implemented new game over music, which is a song Chris sent over that I added entirely. I also added a handful of songs that can be played from the jukebox in the diner found in the first area. The final dungeon also had its music finished, and I really love how it came out. It is no bass track, which adds the sense of melancholy and ambience in the rest of the track. It also gets a reprise of sorts in a later song, but I'm not spoiling that. All the boss music, as well as the post Basil Onko segments, were also finalized. Like with my program usage, I kept track of the length of the soundtrack, and it was a ton of fun seeing it go from less than an hour, to an hour and twenty minutes, to an hour and a half, and eventually over two hours in length. Hey, you wanna know what's fun? Lag. Wait. So, here's a quick rundown for anyone not in the know about how rendering graphics in Game Maker works. Your sprites are sorted onto these large textures called texture sheets. Once a texture sheet is loaded into VRAM, any sprite from that sheet can be loaded into the game with practically zero performance cost. However, if a sprite is on a sheet that isn't loaded into VRAM, that entire sheet has to be loaded to show that sprite. And if you're trying to render loads of different sprites from loads of different sheets, you end up with some noticeable lag spikes, even on good hardware. My texture sheets looked like this. Some frames of the same sprite could be found across a literal dozen different texture sheets. This meant I had to manually sort roughly half the game's sprites onto separate sheets, which isn't hard, it's just very time consuming. I also added a warning for users attempting to play the game in full screen on a non 16x9 monitor, because if there's one thing that will always annoy the hell out of me, it's improper pixel scaling. I also added tons of little easter eggs and fun things all around the game. For example, you can go behind Tay and Roxanne's house at the start of the game and look through the windows you can see from the inside. You can also find an employee's only door on the left side of the diner. I somehow doubt a single person has ever found these on their own. The day after that, December 8th, was the 7 year anniversary of the game's concept. Oh, Christ. If working on a game that looks like this for seven years doesn't prove I'm insane, let me show you how my charting process for the game's rhythm game segments work. Hmm? What's that? You think I use MIDI files or Stepmania chart files? Oh, you sweet summer child. Let me expose you to the horrible, horrible truth! Starting off, I export the song as a MIDI file, then open it up in FL Studio and remove all tracks except for the instrument the chart is based on. I then assign a square wave to the remaining track and shorten the length of the notes. I then export that square wavified version of the song and chuck it into Audacity. I then open up a notepad document and write down the number 0 for the first note. I then go back into Audacity and I select the time between the start of the first and second note. I take the duration of that time and multiply by 60 since the game runs at 60 frames per second. So if it's 1 second, the result is 60 frames, if it's 0.5 seconds, it's 30 frames, and so on. I'll then write that number down after the 0 I added to the notepad argument earlier. Then I repeat this process for every note in that verse of the song until the whole verse is done. Then I add some line breaks and add part 2 and restart the process for the next verse, and do so until every verse is done. I then go through the song and check at which time each verse starts. If they ever repeat, then I write down their starting frame and any frames in which they loop. I then go through the song note for note and decide which note should correspond to which in-game button. Then I write down whichever button I find appropriate as a number from 1 to 4 next to the digits representing the notes in the notepad document. Then I open Game Maker and create a timeline and make a moment for every verse and loop. I then create a timeline for each verse and I add a moment for every note, along with the script creating the correct note at each and every moment. I then go back to the main timeline and create an object at each moment for the verses, and that object runs one of the timelines for one of the verses. When all this is done, I playtest and make sure I didn't mess anything up. I did this for every battle song and riff in the game. Now do you believe me when I tell you I'm insane? Good. Well, let's move on. <clears throat> I finally added a finished shop screen to the game. However, a surprising number of my friends said they loved the placeholder, so I technically kept it in the game. It's on the files and can be found pretty easily by data miners. I was also working on the final non-dungeon area of the game, which is genuinely pretty cool. Remember how I've been alluding to a physical injury, a serious mistake I made while working on the game? Development was going really well. Cutscenes were pretty much done, enemies were pretty much done, soundtracks were pretty much done, and I was in the final stretch preparing for release. Then my wrists started hurting. 
I have a history of issues with my joints, and my wrists hurt on and off from time to time, but this time was different. They were hurting so bad I couldn't get any work done by the end of December. I could maybe make a sprite or two, write a paragraph's worth of code, but hardly any more than that. I couldn't play the guitar, play video games, even hold a cup of coffee for more than a few seconds. I assumed it would fix itself eventually, but it never did. One night, while I was in my bed, I heard a really bad snap from my wrist, and suddenly I felt pain rushing from my hand all the way down to my elbow. I couldn't raise my arm without it hurting, so I called the doctor only a few hours later after hardly getting any sleep, and I managed to get an appointment booked. My wrists, especially my right wrist, had been severely overworked. This is a common thing for people in the tech industry, but my case was worse than usual. For the next two and a half months, I wore wrist braces practically all the time. I used exercise putty to train my wrists, and I didn't get any work done. Practically none whatsoever. I still joined in on meetings and stuff for my internship, and I could draw a little bit every now and then when using correct arm movements, but that was it. I spent all of January watching Breaking Bad and waiting for my wrists to eventually get better. I had to delay the game again after saying the previous time would be the last. I felt like garbage. If you have any takeaway from this video, please let it be this. Take care of your health. Don't wait to get help if you're feeling hurt, and don't hesitate to tell people if you're unable to do something. With all of that said, let's move on to the last couple of months of development, shall we? I'd been focusing very hard on the final boss and true ending, but I decided to take a step back and focus on what was necessary for playtesting first and foremost. I put all my energy into finishing any remaining business with the enemies and puzzles I needed to have tested before I finished the final boss. That was a good decision, because I spent a good week or so working on the boss alone. The final boss music is a staggering 11 minutes long, and if you remember the rant about my awful charting process from a few minutes ago, you can imagine the amount of hours that went into that fight alone. It was around this time that I felt done with the project. Not done as in finished, not done as in out of motivation, but done as in ready to move on and do stuff I'd wanted to do for a while. Tears of the Kingdom would be released in a matter of months. I wanted to give Final Fantasy XIV another chance after not really enjoying my first seven and a half hours with it. I wanted to visit friends and family, I was looking for a job, but weirdly, those things only motivated me further. I had a reason to finish the game, not just to feel the satisfaction of completing an ambitious project, not just finally giving the people who'd been supporting me something to play after all this time. I had a reason to do it for myself and my free time. It's not that I was more important than any of those things, but it did give me a little extra push at the end. It was around this time when the game finally started to look and feel complete that I realized the game's mechanics actually have a certain level of complexity to them. I'd been under the impression that the game was far too simple both as an RPG and as a rhythm game, but it turns out it's actually got strategy and challenge. Stuff like that becomes hard to see when you're replaying the same sections over and over and over and over for the sake of playtesting. I knew that the main reason some people had struggled with the game's difficulty in the past was due to overstrumming, aka pressing buttons when none were supposed to be pressed, but once I realized there was already an incentive not to do so, to keep your combo high, I decided to significantly reduce the amount of damage you take from enemies in the case of overstrumming. This was an instant improvement to the game's balancing. The time had come to focus on some really boring stuff I'd been putting off, namely saving the player's inventory and key items and such, and not just their stats and progress. I'd made the mistakes of saving everything to data structure lists instead of arrays. It works great in action, but not so much when saving and loading information to and from a text file. My solution was to loop through each data structure list and add the name of each item to an array. Upon loading the game, it loops through that saved array, goes through each entry and checks if its name lines up with any of the in-game items. If it does, it adds the corresponding item to the data structure. It was a bit of an annoying workaround, and wouldn't have worked very well if I had like hundreds of different item types, but it was much faster than rewriting the whole system from scratch, and it wasn't that bad considering I only had a couple dozen things to look through. And hey, the game's about music, so let's mention something music related. The last time I'd been to a concert was when I went to see Queen Extravaganza with my sister on Malta back in 2019. The same day the game's Kickstarter was launched, in fact. Then some mysterious virus showed up or something, and suddenly people stopped doing live shows. That was kinda weird. Anyways, I finally got to attend another concert in April, when I went to see Wasp with Crazy Lex as the opener. Going to a live show in person is totally different from seeing one on video. It's just something special about seeing talented people perform music really well, you know? Only about a week after that concert, I went to Poland to meet my friends Casper and Editor, and to surprise our friend Ellie for her birthday. That was a trip I definitely needed at the time. We had a ton of fun, even if I was only there for four days. I got to hold a parrot! 
I'm gonna buy them all. Along with that boring stuff I've been procrastinating with earlier, I added some basic accessibility features. You can choose to add an item called the Pick of Destiny to your inventory, which will greatly boost your attack and max HP, as well as make some encounters with unique mechanics easier. I also added some whale sounds for this hidden guy here, who I thought no one would ever find. Funny thing is, if you want to get the game's secret ending, you actually have to find him now. Funny how that goes. Speaking of funny things from that whale, uh... So, I have a phobia for whales. Sea creatures in general, really, if they're large enough. I blame the eels from Mario 64 and some of the horrific stuff in Finding Nemo. Big thanks to Casper for helping me edit the sounds while I catwood in fear. As playtesting was happening, and I was fixing the last few bugs, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom finally released after many years. I had rarely taken the time to play much of anything in the past year or so, but you bet your ass I played Zelda for a hundred hours in like a week. I actually ordered Live Alive for the Nintendo Switch back in December, because I'd known about the original game for the better part of a decade, but never sat down to play it. However, I didn't actually play, let alone open it, until August, nearly two months after Disharmony's release. It's good. Go play it. It's done. The date is June 20th, 2023. And Disharmony's done. <laughs> after <laughs> many, many years. Um currently watching the credits scroll all the way through for the first time. It's done. It's done. <sighs> That's all. It feels really weird. In one hand, I'm like, Really happy, quite emotional, because <laughs> it's been such a long journey, such a big part of my life. But on the other hand, I feel weirdly lonely. <laughs> like I wrote about it on Discord, but I think I was asleep. <laughs> Sent a message to him today on WhatsApp, and she hasn't replied. <laughs> so I'm just like alone in this weird bubble where I'm done and no one else really knows. <laughs> And I'm in like a really strange mood as well. I could go out for a walk right now, listen to some music. But it's like 11 pm. I could also play Tears of the Kingdom, but be able to focus on the game. Maybe. I don't know. And the weirdest thing of all, which you hear all the time, I haven't really realized I'm done. <laughs> you know? It's a little bit like when someone passes away, you still imagine, like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go visit them. And it's like, oh, no, no. It's, it's the same feeling, but a bit more positive, I guess. <laughs> you know, just, just, a, just a little bit. I'm, I still feel the stress and anxiety of knowing the game isn't done. Even though I know the game is done. <sighs> On June 20th, it will be out in 10 days. People will play it. Not scary. Maybe people who will love the game will find it and play it. That would be awesome. Could also be people who would hate the game or play it, which would be less awesome. I'm not sure if I'm gonna stay awake for another six hours or fall asleep on the spot. But here I am. I'm done. I'm gonna shave tomorrow as well. This fuck has been on her for over a year now. It's time to go. The game was finally, finally done. I listened to two songs right after it was finished. The first was Hoshimachi Suisei's Andromeda. I cried a bit. The second song was Pollyanna from Mother One. That crying I did earlier went from like a light rain shower to the fucking Niagara Falls. It took nearly seven and a half years, but the game was done. Disharmony was done. June 30th, launch day. I was nervous, as anyone would be. The game was hours away from being in people's hands. 
In a way, it was a day like any other. I did the usual, I talked to my friends on Discord, I had my morning coffee, and I listened to music. But it was also quite different. I'm not typically a big party guy, but I'd invited some people over for a little release party. I put together a big playlist and calculated which song had to play when, so that I'd know what would be playing when I'd click the release game button. The game wasn't going to go live until 11pm Central European Standard Time, so it was kind of a long day, but I didn't mind. Party went well, we ordered pizza and had some drinks. I had to replay the game for the thousandth time to showcase some basic mechanics, but at that point I was so used to it that I didn't mind much. Even a lot of my relatives, who have very little interest in video games, had a lot of very nice things to say. Publishing has to have been completed. Your application is now visible in the Steam Store. Oh, hmm. Use our page. Oh. Tell me public. Let's tell me save. Tell me view page. Oh, can I finish the continuing image shop? Oh, no, they can. I was a lot calmer than I expected. I was definitely feeling a lot of things, but I kind of expected to break down and cry hysterically, which didn't happen. <laughs> At least not until about 20 minutes later when I called my friends on Discord and Casper asked how I felt. At which point I immediately started crying uncontrollably for a while. <sighs> Good times. I also made sure to send Steam and Edge codes to all the game's Kickstarter backers, along with a little personalized thank you message. Sometime around midnight, I went out for a walk. Family Jules' cover of Reset from Okami was playing on Spotify, and it almost felt like credits were about Star Rolling. When I found the sales statistics page on Steam, I discovered that the game had already made about $70 in two hours. Sure, that's not impressive by most standards, but it was fun to see. So in the end, the game's launch day turned out to be pretty special. $431. That's how much money the game has made. That doesn't take Valve's 30% cut, nor tax into account. The game is, quite objectively, a massive financial failure. I had a budget of roughly $1,000, and I made less than half of it back after work that had lasted for the better part of a decade. But that's not to say I'm not proud of it. I'll hold off on giving my exact thoughts on the game as a whole, but just because it's a financial failure doesn't mean it wasn't worth making, because the experience of making it has been worth more than any other project I've made, and there's still a lot of aspects I'm proud of. It's obviously sad that the game hasn't sold much, but at the same time it's almost impressive just how little the game has sold. I mean, the game's soundtrack, one of its best aspects that's been priced by people who haven't even played the game, priced at a mighty $5, hasn't sold a single copy. And while I don't mean to turn this whole video into some big sales pitch or anything, if you're interested in buying the game, you could literally be the first person ever to buy it on itch.io. It hasn't sold a single copy, and it's priced the same as on Steam. If nothing else, that's kind of a cool thought, right? And if you've enjoyed the music throughout the video, most, if not all of it, has come from the game's soundtrack, which, like I said, is $5 on Bandcamp. Just saying. Or you could do what plenty of people have done already and pirate the game. Please don't. On a serious note, yes, the game is on plenty of pirate sites. It got cracked and posted to at least three sites within the first 24 hours of release. A large percentage of views from the game's second to last trailer originate from the most popular of these sites. Nearly 30% in fact. Also, shout out to this guy on the site, steamunlock.net, for being a real swell guy. I'm not gonna make some big song and dance about the ethics of video game piracy because ultimately I understand why people do it. It's not like I haven't done it myself. You don't always have money. Especially if you're in school, or you're unemployed, or whatever the case may be, and it's much easier to just type in, insert title here, free download, and there you go, now you can play it. I won't shame anyone who pirates my game, because like I said, I get it, but at least I can ask you to reconsider. I'm not one of the big players here exactly, 
if that wasn't already evident. Losing out on a single copy actually means losing a large cut of my monthly revenue. But what can you do? <laughs> so if you are one of the people who's pirated my game, no hard feelings, but if you're able to support the game in some other way, even just wishlisting the game, you know, basic stuff, even if it's already released, that'd be nice. But I digress. Before I talk about my feelings in the game itself, there's another quick tangent I'd like to get out of the way. This part of the video might come across as a little strange, especially since we're not done talking about the game itself yet, but I'm sure some of you will understand what I mean by this, and why I'm dedicating a whole two paragraphs of the script to it. I pretty much always have some kind of content on in the background while I'm working. Sometimes it's music, as is evident by the many references to it in the game. Other times it's a YouTube video. For all my many years of working on the game, there have been several YouTube and Twitch channels that have seriously kept me sane while working on the game. Channels whose videos I've watched time and time again. I would just like to give a quick shout out to some of these channels. I'm sure I'm forgetting someone here, but I really think they deserve some credit for helping me not want to split my head open. So a big thank you to Vinny and Joel from Vine Sauce, Sugar Conroy, quite literally everyone from Hollow Live, Simple Flips, shoutouts, Rob Scallon, ProZD, Drawfee, The Trash Taste Boys, Chris Broad from Abroad in Japan, Shibuya Kaho, Kason On Air, Mr. Gigi, Jonas Tirola, Did You Know Gaming, 8-Bit Music Theory, Cinemassacre, Mitrorad, Ashens, Carl Jobst, Saberspark, North of the Border, Joel G, and Robber Ross. I want to make it clear that I'm not mentioning these people because I want them to play my game, and I don't want anyone to pester them about it. I don't expect anyone I mention to see this video, and I doubt pretty much a single one of them would even like the game. I just think they genuinely deserve a shout out, both for keeping me sane and inspired. I'm pretty sure I've watched Rob Scallon's first Album in a Day video over a dozen times. I've been following Chugga Conroy for god knows how long. I've watched Simple Flips' videos nearly every day since the start of the pandemic. I've watched Vinny and Joel's content since before the archive channels existed, and if you've followed the channel for a while, you'll know that I tend to mention Hollow Live a lot. Point is, for as parasocial as it may be, throughout seven years of game dev, they become more than background noise. They become company. I will be linking all the channels I mentioned in the description, and if I can think of any more in the future, I'll be sure to add those as well if I have the time for it. Now then, after all this time spent working on the game, what do I, its developer, think about it. Well, it's alright. I'll make some kind of post-mortem retrospective kind of thing in the future, but I'll give you a quick rundown for now. Let's start with the negatives. Graphically, the game isn't exactly impressive. The way I drew the characters a few years ago isn't all that appealing. By the time I realized that, it was too late to scrap it all and draw them from scratch again. They lack any form of real expression, and the scale relative to each other doesn't always make sense. A lot of the tiles look flat too, and sometimes it's hard to tell characters and objects apart from the background. I also wish I'd used a preset color palette from the start to give everything a more uniform look. While I have plenty of thoughts regarding the story and its execution, one thing I'm not particularly happy with is its pacing. Some parts of the game feel pretty slow, while others feel weirdly fast. The structure of the story is similar to games like Mother 3, or perhaps more famously Undertale, but the pacing ended up being closer to something like a Zelda game, and it doesn't always mesh super well. The opening in particular is quite slow, especially relative to the length of the game. The characters would also have greatly benefited from more screen time. The UI is very ugly, and at times a little confusing. I would have spent much more time working on the game's UX elements had I had more time. The game's audio mixing is pretty inconsistent, I really like the soundtrack, particularly the tracks not written by myself, <laughs> but the volume of the sound effects and songs varies a lot. Hey, at least it doesn't blast your ears into oblivion the moment you open the game. But aside from that, I'm honestly quite happy with the game. I'm a sucker for detail, and Disharmony has a lot of it. It has a ton of easter eggs and little details that I doubt anyone has ever noticed. As I alluded to before, you can go behind Tay and Roxanne's house at the start of the game and look through the windows visible from the inside. You can backtrack to check this clock at the White Ridge Inn, and it will say a variety of different things depending on your story progress. The band members of Eternal Wait have unique dialogue if you talk to them after having heard Ash yell at the bartender but before starting a conversation with her. There were a lot of parts where I would have loved to add even more detail, but at some point I had to stop and focus on the broader picture. Even so, I'm really proud of all the random crap the game has. On the topic of detail, some of you may have noticed that the game mixes American and British spellings of certain words. This isn't an error, characters of British accents use the British spelling of said words in the dialogue, and ones with American accents do the same for their accent. While the overworld sprites and tiles don't always look that good, 
I like a lot of the battle sprites and cutscene assets. I also think the animation of the characters is usually pretty good even if the aesthetic of the sprites isn't always on point. The dream sequences are pretty neat. I like the mood I managed to create, and I think they shake up the style and gameplay in pretty cool ways. They probably contain some of the game's most memorable moments and places. While the story has its pacing issues, I think the characters are quite well defined, and I like how a lot of the plot turned out. Without spoiling too much, the game is somewhat of a meta-narrative, but it's not quite the same as most other games that do. I'm more than willing to forgive anyone who'd look at it and think it is the same, but I promise it's not. It's one of those games that has a normal ending, but if you really want to know what's going on behind the scenes, you have to dig pretty deep into it, and I'd be surprised if anyone really figures it out on their own. I can see why some people might not be interested in this sort of semi-convoluted storytelling, but personally I love this stuff, and I think I came up with a lot of cool things. Oh, and some of the jokes are pretty alright, although a lot of my favourite ones are so obscure they might fly over most people's heads. And of course, thankfully, the gameplay is actually quite good. It is really difficult if you aren't used to rhythm games, but the overall design of the battle system is simple to understand but complex enough to keep the player engaged. Getting an enemy's HP as far into the negatives as possible to get more XP at the end of the fight might be one of the best mechanics I've ever come up with, and maintaining high combos that you can use for powerful solos turned out to be a great motivator for people not to spam inputs all the time. There's definitely room for improvement. If I had another go at it, I would expand it a ton, but even as it stands, it works quite well, and a lot of people seem to agree. I also think that some of the puzzles, while a little cryptic at times, have genuinely good solutions, and if you're a fan of games like Silent Hill, I bet you'd get a kick out of them. So, all in all, yes, the game has a fair chunk of flaws, but I definitely wouldn't call it bad. While it is super niche, if it had found the right people, I bet those people would have loved it despite its flaws. As is the case for many obscure indie games. I mean, the handful of people who have played it seem to like it. Oh well, maybe in another timeline. As for Disharmony, even if the number of players is very small, I still intend to support the game by patching it whenever glitches are discovered, and I intend to add more and more accessibility features as time goes on. At the time of writing this, I'm working on the game's first big patch, which fixes one typo, a couple glitches, and will add the ability to add customized input mappings for the rhythm game segment. I may also add more accessibility features, but that may be further down the line depending on how long it takes to finish what I've already started. I'm also working on getting all the Kickstarter rewards produced and shipped, which is taking quite a while, but I'm getting there. Beyond the game itself though, I have a few things brewing in the background. Nothing I'll bring to Kickstarter or any of its competitors, but if you thought Disharmony's development was a wild ride, you might want to hold on tight for the next project. Stay tuned is all I'll say for now. To conclude this very long video, I'll say a few things. First of all, if you're working on something yourself, don't overwork yourself, your health is really important. I felt like I was going insane every day near the end of development, and the pain I felt in my wrists is not something I want to experience just because someone's working on their funny little video game. I'm glad the game is finally done, and I'm proud that I managed to do it all myself, with exceptions of course, but I feel like I've aged 35 years. I also wanted to say that I'm proud. I drew hundreds of sprites and backgrounds, I wrote dozens of songs, and wrote thousands of lines of code. I ran a Kickstarter campaign, and I got a thousand dollars out of it. That Kickstarter campaign got the fabled Project We Love badge. But beyond anything else I may have done or accomplished, I had an idea over seven years ago, and I saw it through to the end.